If you're here, I'm introducing him again. <laughs> um, but this talk is on the future of social coordination of DAOs, and the talk is being hosted by Chandler DeCock, who does growth strategy at Astaria. Chandler focuses on building the future of Web3 by solving the problems that matter to people that work in this space every day. Please welcome Chandler to the stage. <laughs> All right, um, just a Shout out before I get into my talk, the previous panel that we had before this was uh, Web3 Adoption in Africa. I really loved that topic, it was really great, um, and a shout out to the fellow Africans. I hail from, some st from South Africa, so that meant a lot to me, um, so really great to see that. Uh, today's talk um, is really just around uh, why do we need DAOs, um, and why, why do we need to make them better, right? Uh, many of us here are probably in DAOs, uh, and I think we owe it to ourselves to actually make them, um, design them for more humans, uh, and kind of create a more uh, sustainable system for how DAOs work. Uh, my name is Chandler, I lead growth at Astaria, um, and today's lesson... Uh, just... Uh, Thanks. Um, why the DAO experience sucks today. Uh, it's a story of uh, things that I've been through in the DAO ecosystem. Um, and really the three t main topics I want to cover today is just um, things around governance, incentives, and uh, the organization around uh, DAOs as we, as we know them today. Um, a little bit about what I've been up to. I've worked in over 20,000 projects at the moment. Um, I used to help implement uh, UMA's KPI options. Uh, that'll tie quite heavily into what I will be talking about today. Um, I used to work on an optimistic governor module and help spread awareness around just what optimistic governance is. Uh, and I've done a ton of research around uh, governance and incentive programs. So. Uh, we all know what a DAO is. I think this group is a little bit more advanced than most of them. Um, but this is kind of like a very TLDR version of how I see the life cycle of a DAO start, right? A DAO is created, everyone joins, they're excited, there's a lot of hype, a lot of participation, and a lot of contribution. Um, this is actually like most, uh, the most like formative part of the DAO. Um, and then we kind of move over to when DAOs really start to operate, right? And this is where the dynamics change a little bit. Uh, different types of incentive structures are at play, uh, different types of contribution levels and skills. Um, and then you kind of like get to a point where the DAO is in like a sort of a happy medium state. And we kind of continue to uh, see DAOs operate in the space and their life cycle really is captured in this. Um, so if a DAO is operating, you're in the space. But really, then it kind of moves over to uh, when the DAO explodes. And there are many examples of those um, that we'll kind of like just touch on very briefly. This is where um, some incentive dynamics are at play. This is where some of the governance uh, frustrations come into play. Um, and then this is also around some of the, uh, the, the concepts around uh, like infighting and who has rights in the space and who can contribute and who can participate and some of the reasons why, um, why DAOs explode really starts around that, right? So we'll get into some of those in a little bit, um, but I think the one thing that's... Um, one second. Um, I think the thing that's really important here is the things that don't work, right? So I spoke about community contributions and participation, and those two things are actually fundamentally different. My participation in a DAO is very different to my contribution in a DAO. And I think the way that DAOs were structured um, at the moment in these big, monolithic, uh, one token, one vote systems don't really work uh, because you're always going to have a suboptimal level of, of contribution. Why? Why do I say that, right? So participation is not the same. So when I, when I have a token vote uh, or a token in a, in, a, in a DAO and I can vote on some of the governance actions, um, I will always give the bare minimum effort that it takes to be considered a contributor for future rewards and future incentive programs uh, and kind of just be known in the ecosystem. Most organizations actually thrive and do better by, by individuals contributing above and beyond what's expected, right? Like if you think about your job, you work for an intrinsic value and an extrinsic value and those values combined kind of give you what you, your output is and sometimes, you know, the jobs that you don't like doing, you need some extrinsic motivation and the stuff that you really like doing, you can kind of just do for free, right? Um, and so con if you think about how DAO incentive structures are set up at the moment, there really is no um, way to effectively uh, convert people's um, 
lack, in, a lack of willingness to participate, um, sorry, a lack of willingness to contribute on things that they might not be, you know, so excited about, right? And if you look at the, the, the vast majority of, of how, how um, DAO participation works, it's really around token rewards, right? Not every DAO has this, but the, the majority of the ones that we all know today have like a token reward distribution mechanism that actually just is fundamentally flawed, right? If you think about taking your token that's, that's going to ultimately govern your system and airdropping it, put it out for liquidity mining rewards, uh, rewards maximizing um, uh, individuals, um, that kind of like just do the very least that they can to get the reward, uh, grant scraping, all of these kind of concepts provide uh, governance rights to people in the DAO that might not actually be there for the best interest of the DAO. And we can kind of see that like the reward mechanism for something like a liquidity mining is, is not really tied into the longevity of the DAO. Why, why do I say that in kind of the broader concept? Well, like you're just rewarding capital for your DAO and you're paying an extreme cost for that liquidity, sure your protocol needs to function, and sure uh, liquidity is king in, the, in most of the DeFi ecosystems, um, but ultimately you're actually giving away governance rights to somebody that's not going to have a long-term in aligned incentive with your, with your ecosystem. Okay, the things that do work, right? Now, most of the, the protocols that exist today that are highly successful have this like concept of um, insert uh, your, your protocol name, labs, and that's the foundation that works on the protocol. Uniswap Labs works on Uniswap. I used to work at UMA. Uh, we were at UMA uh, Risk Labs that helped uh, build out uh, UMA protocol. Um, and these are normally highly skilled teams that are well compensated um, and have both intrinsic and extrinsic motivation, right? And those kinds of concepts have been extremely successful at building really highly effective products and protocols. How do we translate this into the, uh, the DAO space is actually going to be an important part of what I want to kind of like get towards. Um, but mo most of the time, relative to the size of DAOs, is that they're small, highly motivated teams uh, working on a particular problem, right? Um, and if you think about like some of the, the DAOs that set up this whole uh, conference, um, the Shelling Point DAO, small, highly effective team, um, community organizations, the Ethereum Foundation, again, same, small, small relative just to the, the level of participation. Um, and most of the people that work on, on these protocols or these DAOs or these uh, kind of groups are, are uh, verifiably uh, credible. So, you, you know, you, if I want to work in a developer DAO, I really need to be able to know how to, how to develop. So what are some of the lessons I learned? Um, in my time working with all the DAOs and kind of uh, the f uh, figuring out some of the dynamics on, on like what makes some DAOs successful versus others. And I think the one, um, the one key message that I mentioned a bit earlier is around passing the access to the governance within your ecosystem. Um, we do that far too cheaply at the moment. We do it for the wrong reasons and we reward the wrong types of behavior. And I think there's a very big difference between what is effective for your protocol versus what is effective for your, um, for your governance and your long-term management of your, uh, of, your, of your DAO. I also fundamentally do believe that um, the, the kind of examples that we have at the moment, uh, I, I put up here the sushi swap example, um, that was like the, uh, it should be pretty much studied in every DAO business school when we eventually get to the size of the ecosystem for us to have like DAO business schools. And Sushi Swap will most likely be the, the four core fundamental uh, case study on what, what went wrong and, and what, are the th what are the things that we could do better about that. And again, token reward incentive programs, uh, a governance system that was extremely monolithic, uh, and, the, and the participation in that DAO was, was uh, the, the individuals that had the most context of what they were doing were being stifled by, by members of the, of the community that really didn't actually have the best kind of input in, in that particular topic. So the other one is, is uh, governance this is not easy. I think monolithic DAOs as they exist today uh, uh, are, are a huge uh, issue. Um, I don't think we should be getting rid of big monolithic DAOs. Uh, we'll get into some of the, the dynamics of, of how I think they can change, um, but really right now I think they're extremely painful. Uh, context is missing for everyone. I think if you have to vote on every single vote, you're not going to know everything that you need to do uh, and why this vote is important and kind of like uh, some of the decisions that get made on chain through governance votes uh, are also kind of, they don't actually need to do that. There's a big difference between uh, being able to have like a verifiable trusted execution of a particular outcome versus actually something where you can just kind of agree. As long as like, you know, there's some sort of like soft co consensus around something, you can kind of move on. And, and I don't think everything needs to be voted on. And I think one of the more important elements here is that 
uh, attention in a DAO, especially if you're in many like I've been, is a fading asset. Your token isn't the most valuable uh, part of your DAO. Uh, the, the number of people are not uh, the most important thing in your DAO. The attention that you can garner from people and of, uh, of particular types of skill sets is the most important. Um, and then I, I kind of also briefly touched that not everything needs to be a blockchain vote. Like really, um, there, there are many elements around like how we can, wh what gets put towards a vote and gets discussed is, is sometimes a bit over the top. Uh, bigger is not better. Size size isn't really that important in terms of DAOs. Um, if you look at some of the most effective teams, I remember how like I drew parallels to like highly effective teams building out something. Um, if you look at the size of Uniswap, their team is famously small. Yet they're the biggest uh, asset swapper in us in, in the in the DeFi space. Um, and if you look at some a team like Coinbase, famously large, uh, and they roughly do the same amount of volume. Sure, they've got differentiating products, and sure, you, it's not apples for apples here. But really, the concept here is that bigger DAOs are not necessarily better. You, the more people that you in, introduce into the DAO, the more a, a elements of of like having a a a stifling force in your in your DAO um, starts to become prevalent. And these like mass airdrops and these mass uh, token distributions uh, kind of just go out willy-nilly. They, uh, they typically kind of like help perpetuate that, uh, these large DAOs. Um, and it's not really designed for humans, right? We, we as individual humans only can have X number of contacts uh, between, between ourselves, right? Sure, you might have 10,000 Twitter followers, but you actually only talk to five people on your Discord or five people in your Telegram, and then you ignore all the, the rest of the group chats, right? So um, DAOs are built by humans and are for humans, and we should always kind of keep that as like a core premise of how we design our interactions, even in the DAO space. So I've, I've had some experience with some tools. I'm gonna go through three of them. Um, this is just from my point of view on some of the things that worked and what, what never worked. Um, so the first one was KPI options from the UMA protocol. Um, what a KPI option was, was a basically a, con a conditional payout token where, let's say, for example, I was a, 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 DAO, a DeFi protocol that wanted to get increase my TVL. Um, instead of just distributing liquidity mining rewards or, or doing an airdrop to kind of help promote this, you, you built in a conditional metric and you gave that token to your community members or the stakeholders that could actually improve that. And then, depending on how that metric got achieved over a period of time, you could get more rewards. And you can kind of think of this as a, a really powerful primitive to, to incentivize people kind of in a decentralized way, right? It was really great for community co compensations because you compensated people for an outcome that you got. And so that outcome really, really helped um, motivate the indi uh, the, the each individual kind of on, a, on an extrinsic level. So you kind of gave that reward um, for, for a total outcome. Uh, token rewards and, and outcome-based uh, results were really, really useful for that. So let's say you as a DAO really wanted to get some something done and you would give a reward or a bounty out for it, depending on how well that, that outcome go, uh, be, uh, that, how that outcome was achieved, you would end up getting a, a better result. And we, we found this to be quite a powerful, like primitive mechanism. But then in my experience, I found that there were a lot of issues with these conditional tokens. Firstly, in DAOs, no one actually knows in a DAO what your important, most important metrics are. And this was the most shocking thing I ever experienced. I'd walk up to a team and say, hey, um, they, they would come to me and say, hey, do you want to do uh, KPI options? And I'd say, yes, great, I'm here to help. And they would end up, um, our first question I'd ask is, what's your most important metric? And they kind of like just stood there um, and didn't know what exactly, how to answer that, right? And then there were competing discussions amongst P team members. Um, and so finding a core metric in terms of what you could do in a DAO might not necessarily be the most um, valuable thing for that DAO, because there's, there's a, a wide array of things that DAOs can target. But really, um, when, when, when you have too big a DAO or too big a, an infrastructure, it's really hard to figure out what's that core premise of what that DAO is ultimately um, achieving. And then on the other side uh, of this is that uh, these KPI options with, with smart contracts and, and tokens, um, there was a lot of effort to put into place for like smaller, um, smaller incentive programs. And in the case of like something like Sushi, where the, the community really mistrusted the team and there was this conflict, KPI options made sense there because it was kind of like an on-chain guarantee, whereas most DAOs and most community members really do trust their DAO. So just saying, hey, we can do this um, and we'll you know, give your reward out if we achieve these results is actually something that um, is a lot more efficient. And I think taking that out of the, 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 the smart contract side and putting it in the, in the social layer actually proved to be a little bit more effective. Um, the other topic that I worked on uh, for a while was optimistic governance. 
I call this the lazy DAO's choice. Um, optimistic governance, uh, for anyone that doesn't know, is um, most actions of, of governance get executed by multi-sigs. Multi-sigs uh, are a legal liability for the signer and also a security hole. Um, and so you, what you can then do is instead of actually submitting, uh, everyone sign that, and again, attention, um, attention is the most important thing. The, the multi-sig signers ultimately really uh, struggle to, um, to keep up with uh, the context of everything that they're signing, right? Uh, just like every vote, you don't have all the context, every, every signature for a multi-sig executor is the same. So um, what you can in, then do with an optimistic governor is uh, basically submit the transactions that would execute on the, on the, um, on the, on the wallet. And that execution can, uh, can be vetoed by someone um, in an optimistic sense. So uh, transactions can be submitted, and all you have to do is have one person disagree with it if there's anything wrong, right? So less votes, uh, less on-chain actions. Uh, so great idea, right? Um, there was actually a talk on this stage yesterday by someone called Isaac that, that went into a lot more detail. So if you want to know more details of how, um, how that all plugs in from SnafeSap to reality.eth and, and how that and the configuration of one of these are, uh, that's a great idea. But really, these are extremely um, new and untested. And one of the biggest issues that you can have is you could actually submit a transaction and if no one is watching, steal some funds. Right? I remember how I said like attention is the the most important part of of governance. Even in a in a in a tool that allows you to uh, uh, govern um, in a more optimistic sense, um, th there is a security hole there because the security is based on the assumption that everyone is watching these transactions. So. Optimistic governance, I think, also induces a lot of anxiety for individuals. Um, when you, as, a, as an executor, execute a transaction uh, on a multi-sig, you know when you have to do it, you can see that transaction, and you know nothing's gonna happen if you don't do something. The dynamic with optimistic governance is flipped around where if you don't look at something, something might happen without you, you kind of like paying attention. And that's hugely scary, right? You're now gonna be sitting here going every single time, checking your multi-sig if there's a new uh, proposal for a transaction coming through. And so conceptually, I think optimistic governance doesn't really sit so well uh, for DAOs that are lacking in attention or, or super monolithic. Um, and maybe they can be a bit more effective at the smaller scale um, and also smaller treasury size. So um, Isaac yesterday spoke about how he stole seven ETH Ethically, he returned it um, because the SafeSnap um, team uh, weren't paying attention, right? And they even paid attention, tried to catch him out, and so they blocked the transaction. He reinitiated, and then they forgot to pay attention again, and then he ended up uh, draining that small honeypot. And so optimistic governance, again, kind of an interesting uh, uh, dynamic on, on how you can like improve just that monolithic governance size. But really the most important thing that I think I, I've seen be a lot more effective in my time is this concept of pods, units, or cores. There's, there's not a, a clear vernacular on exactly what we're gonna call this, but these small, highly effective teams that fit together within a larger organization. And these effective teams basically uh, are, are, are focusing on one core element, right? Maker does this in, a, in, a, in their kind of units um, uh, breakup, and that's somewhat, ha have, has somewhat been effective, and they largely live within the, the Maker ecosystem. But if you look at something um, on how, how you can kind of uh, compose these core units into something that's far more effective, you can actually start moving your core mini DAO or core uh, mini units or pod uh, to other DAOs, right? So you, not only can you live with the DAO within isolation, you can start um, having this hub and spoke mechanism where you get DAOs within DAOs and those DAOs help out other DAOs and you can kind of see a, a far more interconnected world. The teams are far more efficient and far more effective because they're smaller, they govern themselves, they choose the tools that they want to do with, and the tooling that exists right now can kind of help in, uh, input them into a lot more of the ecosystem. Um, they can govern themselves whether they choose that to be optimistic or not, or if they do it on a, co on a contract layer uh, with a with multi-sig, or they just trust someone in, in, intrinsically. But we can kind of see that these core units uh, become really, really effective. And I, I, I'm sure many of you have been to some of the side events that happen um, at this conference and many of those side events actually are done by core units, and those core units can actually be helpful to other teams. So um, the, the, one that, the one example is that Divinity event last night. Um, I went to it for a little bit, and they can, that team, really highly effective, can do side events for a bunch of other um, DAOs or, 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 or projects if they, if they so choose. Um, so yeah, highly effective core units that govern themselves, uh, that fit within a larger organization or can be part of multiple organizations is extremely um, far more effective and a better return to scale. Um, 
And so ultimately what I kind of get towards is what does the future look like with the kind of lessons that I've learned and some of the, the, the things that I've seen? So what does the future look like to me? Um, I think any sort of data structure needs three core elements. It's incentive, it's a, a, an incentive program, it's governance, and it's organizations. You really want a small team of highly effective and motivated individuals to work uh, on a particular project or a particular problem that they all agree is the, uh, is the common goal that they're wanting to work at work on, um, and that the smaller you, the smaller your unit or the more effective your unit, uh, the more uh, the more you can do in a, in a daily basis. And the other side of that is you can even have these small units fit within a larger organization, right? People naturally like to fit within a small group, and that small group can identify as part of a, a big ecosystem. Um, all right, and then the other one was being clear on participation versus contribution, right? I can participate uh, in the Ethereum ecosystem. I can also contribute to the Ethereum ecosystem. Those two things, I think, are really, really, really important uh, to, be, to be very clear. Uh, on when, when you're kind of working in, in, in a DAO, right? Um, I'm part of a many, many discords. Um, sometimes it gets a bit noisy, and so I don't necessarily contribute to every single one, but I do participate in many of them uh, and keep up with the news. And as, I, as a participant in many DAOs, I know what my role would there be. Is uh, I have a vested interest, uh, whether it be intrinsic or extrinsic, to want to make sure that that DAO survives and grows and, and becomes uh, a vibrant uh, ecosystem. But then uh, the contribution side should be an active decision from my side to, to contribute in that space. Um, and I think that right now a lot of people misstrewed being a contributor versus a participant um, and you get a lot of armchair commentary from participants pretending to be uh, 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 contributors and I feel like that uh, often is quite a stifling force uh, with any sort of like governance issue and action. Now, now being a participant that raises a, a valid concern and a valid issue is, is not kind of the point I'm touching on here. Um, it, the point is, is when a participant that has no understanding of the problem that 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 the uh, contributors are working on is um, is a big issue. Like I, I can't tell you how many times you, you've seen like these long, well thought out forum posts, and you just see two, three people go, "No, nope, this doesn't make sense to me. I don't, I don't like it." In in forum posts, and that governance happens on on a lot of these forum posts, and that's that's so like disheartening to the actual contributors. That leads to the infighting and the ultimate explosion of of the DAO. Cool, so that's mainly what I want to do and talk about today. I have one last shout out um, to do not really related to, to my talk, um, but my ex-colleague uh, Clayton at Uma uh, sent out this tweet where he is asking everyone for, um, uh, for laptops, phones, uh, you know, for everyone that's got, uh, that's AlpSec secure, that bought a new phone, bought a new laptop for, for Columbia, um, you can actually put that to use. Uh, that these are going to, um, to uh, students uh, for, on an education uh, path to basically uh, learn, uh, have the access to the internet to, to kind of just learn. And it's going to be Web3 focused, so it's basically onboarding more people in the Web3 for people that are in need. Um, he's already collected over 20 devices. I think actually I, didn't, I checked with him yesterday. It's, it's closer to 50 at the moment. So if you have a new phone, um, or if you have an old phone or an old laptop or an old iPad, any internet connected device um, downstairs in the, um, in, uh, in the vibes room with the chair and the music, uh, there's a guy there that's called John. You can drop your device there. Um, if you do want to still contribute to this and you don't have your device here, I also recommend um, uh, handing it over into someone in Miami. They do have an office there. So if you're in the US, you can also contribute to this. Um, and this, I think, is just a really great way to say thanks to the, um, the team in Bogota and, and the entire um, city for hosting us. It's been a really exciting experience. And um, I've really loved my time here in Bogota. So thank you to Bogota. This is a good way, I think, that you can say uh, thanks to the Colombian people for hosting a really awesome DevCon. Um, I've got a bunch of time for questions if you'd like. One question, probably. Yeah, one question. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> you mentioned, um, you know, small teams working towards a common goal, but I didn't see you talk much about how you come up with that common goal and how all these small teams could agree on that common goal because that's, in my experience, has been a, a big problem in a couple of hours where they don't agree on the common goal and so then they break apart in their own ways and the arguing starts happening. Yeah, um, 
I think naturally when, when, when uh, like-minded individuals get in a room, they're, they're often like, oh, this is, the, this is the problem that we're working on, this is the kind of solution that we're working on, uh, let's go do that, right? Like, I, I'm gonna use the Shelling Point example again. They're fundamentally there to like help public goods and the, the conversation, the discourse, and the whole like uh, dynamic around public goods funding. Um, and so they, they all work towards that common goal, right? And if you no longer wanna work on that common goal, you can, you can go in and out. So that, that was like an organic formation based on people just coming together. I think DAOs that come together that aren't part of a, a like common goal, they just kind of wanna you know, get, get, get together. I think that's more like a social club. And so I think, I think being intentional about what you wanna do uh, with a group of individuals is, is multi it's extremely important, right? Because then you can direct your effort, you can direct your attention, and you can direct your, your, um, your like common collective um, outcomes. Thanks, guys.